Hey guys, um, I tried to make it so you could see the pictures of the PowerPoint in the video, but it's not working well. Um, so we're just, we're gonna ignore that and just go with it. Um, I did my presentation on John M. Perkins, and if you do decide to go look him up, make sure you include the M in there because John Perkins is also a different guy, um, that's also an author, so kind of easy to confuse, but, um, yeah. So, John Perkins was born June 16th in 1930, um, and he was born in Mississippi. His story starts off kind of tragic. Um, his mother dies when he was seven months old from a malnutrition disease, and around that time, his father, his name is Jack, um, he leaves home, and he doesn't really return. There's a couple times that he comes back, but he's really harsh with John, and um, just not not a father-like example and so John doesn't really credit him for anything. Um, instead, Jap's mother, um, a lot of people in the neighborhood knew her as Aunt Babe and she raised him. She had already raised 19 kids of her own and so Jap had five kids and she tried to raise all five um, but financially she just couldn't afford it. So she kept John because he's the baby and then Clyde because he was old enough to do work in the fields and help with chores, stuff like that. And then the rest she had to give away. Um, an interesting thing about John, he went to school until third grade. Um, at that time, children didn't go to school long. They just went to school to learn the very basics to help out in the fields. And then once they had learned that, they kind of dropped out. Um, so he did drop out in third grade. However, it's worth mentioning that he received, has received 14 honorary doctorate degrees from universities and colleges across the country. Um, so even if he didn't receive like a formal education, he is very well educated. Um, something tragic that happened pretty early on, uh, when John was 16, his brother Claude passed away. He talks about this experience in his autobiography. Um, it's called Let Justice Roll Down. I haven't read the whole thing, but I have read um, big chunks of it and I definitely recommend reading it. What basically happened is they were all in the town on a Saturday night and Clyde and his girlfriend got in a little bit of an argument and so the town marshal came by um said some profanity that I don't care to repeat um Clyde turned around to face the marshal and the marshal struck him with um I'm forgetting the word the sick I'm sorry guys I don't know what it's called um and so in response Clyde grabbed that and then the marshal shot him and so the tragic part for John is a his brother died, um, but also he, there was an hour and a half car ride to the nearest hospital, and John held Clyde the whole time and just kind of watched the life like fly out of him. And so um, eventually, Clyde dies, and John is at that time staying with his aunt and uncle, and so they're a little bit worried that he is going to say something out of line and also get himself killed. And so they save up enough money to send him to California. Um, he, like, on his way to California, he had $3, a change of clothes, and a pack of lunch. And somehow he made it. Um, he did pretty okay for himself in California. Um, he had a few different jobs. He eventually got drafted for a little bit. And he does end up marrying a woman named Vera May, and they have a really cute family. They have five kids, and this is a picture of them. Sorry, guys. Doing the best I can. Um, so he marries Vera May in 1951, and he has five kids. Um, Spencer is her oldest, and he started going to a church in the neighborhood. And so eventually he convinces his parents to go with, and they do. Um, John spends a few years researching Christianity, going through the Bible, that kind of thing, and then commits his life to Christ in 1957. Three years later, um, he decides to go back to Mississippi. This is really important because when he left to go to California, he vowed never to go back to Mississippi. The way that people, the way that white people treated the blacks is not okay with him, and he wasn't going to go back to that. So for him to voluntarily go back and um, just spread the gospel is really unique. Um, what's different about John than I feel like some of the other people we've learned about is that he was very hesitant about different aspects of the civil rights movement, and he wasn't altogether interested in that. He was interested in the gospel. However, when he got to Mississippi, when he started to interact with the community, interact with the people, he realized that in order for him to really bring the gospel, he was going to have to partake in the civil rights movement. 
and so he started to. Um, he began to register voters, organized co-ops, started a health clinic. Um, black churches in the area kept him at an arm's length because of some of the things that he was saying, and so he created his own. He organized marches, demonstrations, boycotts, you name it, he seemed to do it. Um, another traumatic thing that he talked about in his autobiography, um, in the late 1970s, he was arrested. He had gone to the jail kind of willingly um, because they had 18 minors that were associated with his ministry. And so he went with a couple of friends um, to try to get them out. Instead, um, <laughs> instead, he got arrested and he was nearly beaten to death. They kicked and punched his head, his ribs, and groin for hours. Um, the officers even shoved a fork in his nose and throat. And then once they were done with that, um, they started to whip him until he couldn't feel his body. He doesn't remember most of it. The only thing he remembers is waking up in a pool of blood. And so something that he says that just, I just, I can't even begin to comprehend it, but um, this is a direct quote. He says, there was a king in the Old Testament who, when he was caught in the midst of fire, said, Lord, I don't know what to do, but my eyes are on you. I need to find that joy and suffering. The earliest Christians saw suffering for Christ as a joyful experience. I wrestle with this every day. I just, um, hearing the way that he viewed suffering, it blew my mind. I, um, I just can't even put into words. And then some of the articles that I read just very vividly described um, this beating and I can't even comprehend. I really can't. I don't have any words. This wasn't the last time he was arrested. Um, he was arrested again. Um, the one that I found was in 2005 and he was protesting against the U.S. government for taking away money from different, um, programs that were helping the poor. And so, um, he was definitely known for standing up for them. Um, as far as reconciliation goes, there were something that he called the three R's. So I'm just going to talk about those. Um, the first is reconciliation. This means that he didn't believe in elevating box during the civil rights movement or at all. Essentially, um, that was never his goal nor his intention. And he didn't believe in fighting for violence. Rather, he wanted all ethnicities to work and worship together. I think part of that stems from his first days in ministry. Um, he had two white pastor friends that ended up committing suicide because um, they tried to befriend blacks and they got so much lashback for it that they eventually just couldn't take it anymore. And so he never thought as like of the white life as inferior and he wanted unity. Like he really truly desired for all races to be reconciled. Even more, I think, like, he didn't really focus on the concept of equality, but reconciliation. Um, the second is relocation. So he believed that if you're going to minister to the poor, then you need to be living with the poor. You need to be in their situation, fighting with them, fighting for them. You living outside of their neighborhood is not as impactful as it could be. And if you really want change to happen, then you need to go into the life that they're experiencing. Um, and the last one is redistribution. This one is a little bit confusing um, for me too. It kind of talks about money and he essentially is saying like, look, I understand that black people don't have as many opportunities as white people, but the opportunity that you do have, take it. And if you don't have any, create it. Um, because in order for the economy to grow, in order for us to grow, money needs to change hands. So whatever like small businesses or whatever you can think of, like, do it. Um, but it's kind of his thought process. He didn't believe in letting the lack of opportunity determine your future or your circumstances. He empathized with it. He just didn't believe in letting it determine everything. Um, I am running out of time, so that's pretty much where I'm going to stop. But I will say that he is still active today. He has quite an impressive list of ministries. Um, he did move back to Pasadena, California. He moved to a neighborhood that is one of the highest daytime crime rates, and he did a lot of work there. Um, it goes back to his three R's. And they also have, um, like most of the ministries that him and his friends helped create are still alive today. Um, they might have different names, but they are still doing work. Um, the last thing is I'm going to link a song in the comments. Um, Switchfoot wrote a song kind of inspired by him and 
I don't know. It was just really interesting. So I'm going to link that. And if you guys want to listen to it, go for it. Um, other than that, I had, there's so much more I could say. I just don't have time. So I'm sorry, but I hope you guys have a good Monday.